everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen, sitting in tonight for Alex Jones. It is Thursday, February 16th, 2012, and here's a quick look at what we have lined up for you this evening. Could the U.S. and Israel be planning to launch a false flag terror attack to be blamed on Iran? Tonight, we'll look at the history of government-sponsored terrorism and the likelihood of a conflict igniting in the Persian Gulf. InfoWars producer John Bown also reports on the psychological warfare and operations behind false flag terrorism, known as the Hegelian dialectic. Then, the unthinkable, surviving a nuclear disaster. Author Matthew Stein joins us via video Skype to discuss the apocalyptic scenario of a worldwide nuclear meltdown during a massive solar storm. <laughs> All that and more during the next 30 minutes or so. But first, we have breaking news from Detroit, where the underwear bomber Patsy faces life sentencing today. Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab, the Nigerian man accused of trying to detonate an explosive device in his underwear aboard a Christmas 2009 flight to Detroit, where he pleaded guilty to all counts in court on Wednesday. He had previously pleaded not guilty to the charges, and he had actually vowed uh, to plead innocent. He was going to call Detroit area attorney and eyewitness Kurt Haskell as a defense witness. Haskell, of course, witnessed a sharp-dressed man helping Abdul Mutalab get on board the plane, and this mysterious well-dressed man helped the underwear bomber clear security despite the fact he had no passport. Haskell maintains that Abdul Mutalab was carrying a fake bomb and was the unwitting dupe in a case of government entrapment. And Kurt Haskell joins us now live via video Skype to, uh, from Detroit to bring us the latest developments on this case. Now, Kurt, thank you for joining us. I know you've been a prominent skeptic of the government's official version of events that day. What went on during the sentencing? Well, you know, today was the day for sentencing, and it was a mandatory life sentence. So Judge Edmonds sends Umar to four mandatory, four life sentences without chance of parole. So really is a life term. Now, I understand that there were five witnesses called to the stand. Um, what did any of the other victims, did they have anything to say? Um, we weren't really called to the stand. What happened was every victim of this crime had a chance to make a statement before okay. sentencing. So uh, only five people decided to do that out of 289 passengers, I think. Imagine that. Yeah, imagine that. And uh, Lori and I were two of the five. So besides us, there were only three others. And um, Judge Admins put a limit on it that we can only talk five minutes each. So I've been making a very, very compacted statement to try and fit it into five minutes that, you know, that I wrote earlier this week. And I, you know, I gave my statement today, basically ripping on the government as I've been doing for two years now. And that, that statement is posted on our website, Infowars.com. And also remember that you posted in your blog back in 2011 um, that you decided not to file a lawsuit. Can you tell us why? Yeah, you know, that was a really, really, really hard decision. I went back and forth on it. Uh, I'm going to file and I'm not going to file. I'm going to file and I'm not going to. And every time I'd work on the case, I would figure out that it was – much, much, much more time consuming than I thought it would be. I, you know, I thought it'd be fairly simple. And every time I'd look into it, you know, there'd be this law and that law and this law. I mean, we're talking about international law, aviation law, things I know nothing about. And I was spending a ton of time on it. And uh, that was one of the reasons. But also, um, the when the NDAA was passed mm -hmm. a, a month or so ago. Yes. I was really not happy with the reaction by the American public. I thought, to me, the NDAA is maybe the worst law ever. Well, up there with the Patriot Act, anyway. Agreed. Uh, I, thought, I thought there should have been picketing in the streets, you know, people going crazy in Washington over this, and there was basically nothing. And that got me thinking, well, does anybody really care if I file a civil suit against the government in the underwear bomber case? And my, you know, my thinking was, no except for the people that are already caring about what I do. And so that was reason number two. And reason number three was that 
Uh, President Obama appointed a bipartisan commission to study the economy, and they came out with a report uh, about two months ago or three months ago, and every single person that was in the committee indicated that the U.S. Gov government would collapse and the U.S. And the US would collapse economically no later than fall 2013. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if I had filed a lawsuit against the government, it would most likely take longer than that, number one. Number two, it got me thinking that maybe in spend it, instead of spending so much time on the lawsuit, I need to spend time preparing to move to Costa Rica, as mm -hmm. I've had planned for several years, and save as much money as I can to do that. So it was a combination of all those things. Well, sure, and, and fortunately, by at, at least by going up there and, and giving your statement, I mean, you are getting some national attention. The Detroit Press has quoted you. Um, they also say that you still believe, and this, this is in the Detroit Press today, that uh, Kurt Haskell said he still believes a federal agent gave um, Abdul Muttalabab a, a defective bomb to carry out on the plane to create an incident that would cause the government to install full body scanners at airports nationwide. So um, by you coming out and reading statements like that, you know, at least we're getting some national attention about the body scanners. Um, but um, in closing, I wanted to ask you if there's anything you'd like to share with us about the court case, about the jury, the whitewash, or even the event itself. Um, yeah, a couple things. One, you know, when I made my statement today, uh, Judge Edmonds was not happy with me. She was pissed that I made my statement today and said what I did. Uh, obviously, did, she did. Did anybody uh, warn you not to make this statement beforehand, or did you get any kind of uh, bad, you know, vibe, I, like, man, I shouldn't be doing this? Or how, how was the uh, climate when you went in there? I didn't tell anyone what I was going to say. Yeah. Nobody. Um, I, except for your show. I did tell your show with instructions to not post my statement on the internet yeah. until after I gave it for right. that reason. I didn't want anyone to know what I was going to say because I thought Judge Edmonds might try and stop me. Sure. Now, when I gave my statement, um, I intentionally wanted to uh, get some sympathy in the hopes that Judge Edmonds would not cut me off. So what I did is I thanked the person that saved my life, who was also there today, the flight attendant that put out the fire, which kind of choked me up a little, and uh, to get some sympathy so that she would not cut me off. And she did not cut me off, uh, which was my goal. But she was very, very, very pissed, I could tell. Mm -hmm. And she, Lori gave her speech after I did, and Judge Ed, Edmonds asked her before she went up there if she was going to uh, talk about the government being involved before she got up there. Wow. So that was kind of funny. Um, about the case itself, though, one thing still really bothers me, and that's, you know, um, Umar pled guilty to a mandatory life sentence. So why, why would you do that? Not only that, you know, nobody pleads guilty to a mandatory life sentence. If you take a plea deal, there's some give and take. You know, you get you take a lesser charge or, you know, maybe there's some leniency in your sentence. There, were, there was nothing there. Uh, the plea deal was taken five days after he announced that I'd be testifying on his behalf. I remember. Yeah. Five days later, uh, he takes a plea to a mandatory life sentence. No way. No way does that happen without something else going on here. Sure. I don't know what it is. I don't believe it. Um, I think there's some kind of deal going on that we don't know about that isn't being reported. Um, I don't know what it is, though. Not only that, but Anthony Chambers, the standby attorney, uh, told me that there were very lenient plea deals on the table all along, going back over a year. So why would someone turn down a lenient plea deal to take a plea knowing you would get mandatory life sentence with no chance of parole? That's the question I really want answered right now. You know, we'll never get an answer, but. Yeah, true. And he was, he was obviously influenced in some way. Well, um, we certainly thank you for joining us. Um, we appreciate you coming forward. Your involvement in the case has undoubtedly shed light on, you know, possible government complicity. And without you speaking out, the historical details would have never seen the light of day. So I admire your, your courage. And, um, well, may the Lord protect you, sir. Thanks a lot. All righty.
Okay, so once again, the patsy gets life in prison. No big surprise there. Continuing with our top headlines, Big Sis admits that the U.S. does not face a terror threat from Iran or Hezbollah, despite all the hype drummed up by the establishment media about a scary Iranian or Hezbollah attack on soft targets in the United States. The Department of Homeland Security has admitted that there is no specific threat facing the country. DHS boss Janet Dungbeetle Napolitano was obliged to admit that no such threat exists. She said, however, that there is a threat that bears watching. Meanwhile, CNN and the establishment media have enthusiastically hyped Israel's terror narrative by running reports and stories speculating an attack on Jewish targets inside the United States. The medical establishment is firing patients who refuse big pharma, big government vaccines. This is an article posted in the Wall Street Journal where they mention a study of Connecticut pediatricians published last year says that some 30% or 133 doctors said that they had asked a family to leave their practice for vaccine refusal. Can you imagine? And a recent survey of 909 Midwestern pediatricians found that 21% reported discharging families for the same reason. Well, now two can play at that game. If your doctor or pediatrician wants to inject you and your children with toxic chemicals, then you fire them and find yourself another doctor. I suggest that you, uh, well, you can learn more about the dangers of vaccines. Go to vactruth.com, do the research yourself. And I'm sure you'll make the right decision. Now, before we start talking about false flag terrorism, I wanna take you to a piece that was put together by our very own John Bound. He's a very talented writer and producer here at infowars.com. And he's going to educate us on the Hegelian dialectic and he's focusing on the psychology behind government-sponsored terrorism. The global banking cartel has used one tried-and-true process to create wars, rob us of our currency, and eat away at our substance. This process of control over the masses is called the Hegelian dialectic. So what is it, and how is it being used today? German philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel devised a dialectic, or method to resolve a disagreement between outcomes. The dialectic is made up of three attributes. Thesis, an idea or opinion. Antithesis, the opposite idea or opinion. And synthesis, the alchemic process to bring together a wanted change. It is commonly referred to as order out of chaos and is waged against the masses in many forms. Saul Alinsky, self-avowed Marxist, proponent of the Hegelian dialectic, published this in Rules for Radicals. Any revolutionary change must be preceded by a passive, affirmative, non-challenging attitude toward change among the mass of our people. They must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that they are willing to let go of the past and chance the future. George Bush became the hero of 9-11 simply due to the fact that he was the president and then rammed through legislation that threatened our liberties as we all complacently stood by and allowed it to happen. A manufactured crisis occurs, thesis. George Bush answers it by rallying public opinion and becoming the host of the tragedy, antithesis thus owning the crisis through synthesis. Equilibrium is attained. All of the once separate parts of the plan are joined together. In this example, the Patriot Act acting as the equilibrium on the desired road to tyrannical fascism in America. They're too good at what they're doing. They create the crisis on record. They sell the fraud. Then they say, give us more power. Give up your sovereignty, Europe, America, and we'll fix it. But then it only implodes faster. They make bigger bonuses but they're destroying their own golden goose. They're hacking it open greedily when it's giving them a golden egg every morning. They think there's eggs inside. Uh, I, I think the point you made of that, the, because they're on record creating this to consolidate power, they've bragged about it. Uh, you know, those, those memos have been made public by Goldman Sachs and others, but they're gonna fry things so badly, the bankers are all running to private islands with their own security teams. I mean, 
like th th they want to rule everything so much and have just so many digits in their bank accounts that they're going to devalue the value of the digits through their sheer greed. That is a possibility. And if you look at the Hegelian dialectic, uh, if that, that crisis at the beginning spins out of control, uh, they lose the tail end of the dialectic, don't they? Uh, there will be no synthesis at the end. They'll be lucky if they survive. Another method to manipulate the masses is the use of two opposing views to attain the desired view. Politician A espouses the first view. Politician B counters with the differing view. A clear example of this was the debate over the unconstitutional NDAA bill of 2012. I strongly believe that the United States government should not have the ability to lock away its citizens for years and perhaps decades without charging them and providing a heightened level of due pro process. We don't pick up citizens, we don't incarcerate them, for 10 or 15 or 20 years or until hostilities end and no one knows when they will end without giving them due process of law. The great concern that we have now in terms of the security of the homeland uh, is from so-called uh, homegrown terrorists, radicalized Americans. So uh, these people, in my opinion, have, have uh, taken sides They've joined the enemy. And uh, to have this body at this time as the threat of homegrown terrorism rises, saying no, they can't be treated as enemy combatants, uh, is not, not only doesn't make sense and, and is uh, uh, totally uh, um, uh, unresponsive to the facts that I've just described. President Obama threatened to veto the bill as long as it contained the section concerning due process, and then quickly changed his mind before the final version was voted through Congress. Obama then told the media that the version he had signed was revised to eliminate any threat to freedom of American citizens, even though this was not true, and the bill gives extraordinary powers to detain American citizens without a trial. The media synthesized Obama's lie by claiming that Obama will not use the powers he now has. The desired result is synthesized by mainstream media as they turn a blind eye to the debate. The American people cave into the lie because the process it is attached to seems so familiar. John Bown, InfoWars Nightly News. And that brings us to our next segment, there are literally hundreds of examples throughout history of government-sponsored terrorism, known as false flag operations. And chances are that the United States and Israel plan on orchestrating such an event to be blamed on Iran as a pretext for war. It is a fact that virtually every single war since the Spanish-American War of 1898 has included the use of a false flag operation as an excuse to enter into conflict. But unfortunately, the lies have been covered after the fact, too late to prevent mass death and destruction. In 1953, the CIA and British intelligence staged terror attacks to overthrow the democratically elected leader of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh. Mossadegh had nationalized Iran's oil fields and denied British petroleum a monopoly. U.S. and British intelligence operatives launched a successful coup d'etat and overthrew the Iranian government, replacing the regime with a ruthless dictatorship while seizing control of Iran's oil supply. 1964. U.S. warships were apparently attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats, an incident that kicked off the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. The attack was a staged event that never actually took place. What followed was an excuse by President Lyndon Johnson to dramatically expand the scale of the Vietnam War. Ultimately, at the cost of three or four million dead Vietnamese and 58,000 Americans. June 8, 1967. 
The USS Liberty, an American naval vessel sailing off the coast of Gaza, was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of Israel. The well-coordinated attack, which lasted for hours, resulted in the deaths of 34 crewmen, 170 injured, and catastrophic damage to the ship one of the most highly decorated vessels in U.S. history. Egypt was to be blamed for the attack, to serve as a pretext to drag the U.S. and her allies into war in the Middle East. If not for the heroic efforts of the ship's captain and his brave crew, the Liberty would have faced almost certain destruction. The truth about Israel's attack and subsequent White House cover-up continues to be officially concealed from the American people to this day. Now, in recent weeks, we have seen a massive buildup in the Persian Gulf by both the United States and Britain. Meanwhile, U.S. and Israeli intelligence sources are officially warning of domestic terror attacks inside the U.S. and Israel. And if a conflict is to ignite in the Persian Gulf, it is highly likely that the U.S. or Israel will use a false flag operation to kick things off. And that brings us to our quote of the day. Ask yourself... Would a government that has lied us into two wars and is working to lie us into an attack on Iran shrink from staging terrorist attacks in order to remove opposition to its agenda? And that was by Paul Craig Roberts, the former secretary to the Treasury in the Reagan administration, also known as the father of Reaganomics and a frequent guest on our show. I actually think uh, he was referring to the Bush administration when he made that statement, but I'm sure Craig Roberts wouldn't put it past the Obama administration to carry out a false flag terror attack as well. But, you know, I mean, they're both run by the same offshore banking cartels and the military industrial complex. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Now, uh, that does it for the first half of our show. We're going to go to break. But when we come back, I'm going to interview author Matthew Stein. He's the author of When Disaster Strikes, a comprehensive guide for emergency planning and crisis survival. We're going to discuss the unthinkable, surviving a nuclear disaster. So stick with us. This is information I'm sure you're going to want to see. It could very well one day save your life and the lives of your loved ones. Matt Stein, when we return right after this. We were brought up loving our country and our constitution. That in the United States of America, we were free. And that's an attitude that we've tried to instill in our children. I met my wife while uh, in the Air Force. I was a combat pilot in Vietnam. I served in Desert Storm as a commander. When I graduated from the academy, I took the oath of office. Uh, and as a commander, I administered that oath to many people. Now I, I wonder about the understanding people have of our constitution. And I think about our candidates for President of the United States. Uh, it's interesting to see the support Ron Paul gets from the military. And if we think back to the code of conduct uh, and people raising their right hand that they were gonna support and defend the Constitution of the United States, why would those same people support in great numbers Ron Paul? I think it's because they know that he supports the Constitution of the United States. It doesn't mean you have to go to war to do it. Uh, it means you have to understand what the Constitution is and be a supporter inside of your own country, whether you're in the military or not, of that Constitution and make the United States strong. And Ron Paul does that. That's his feeling. That's his thrust. And that's why if you look at the percentages that support him in the military, it's huge. Why is that? because they've raised their right hands and they're putting their lives on the line for us here in the United States. And they know that Ron Paul does the same. Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm gonna take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick, and how to defeat them. 
So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at Infowars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at Infowars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events. And we are back. Thank you for joining us. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Once again, I'm your host, Darren McBreen, sitting in tonight for Alex Jones. Now, before we talk with Matthew Stein, I want to play a short video clip that I found on the NASA.gov, their official website. And it is a guide to solar flares. I thought it would be a good educational piece to share with our viewers before we start the interview. Let's take a look. Solar flares may seem like faraway events, but they can damage satellites and even ground-based technologies and power grids. Every 11 years, as the sun reaches its maximum activity, they become bigger and more common, and that increases the chances that one will significantly affect Earth. So what are these solar eruptions? A solar flare is basically an explosion on the surface of the sun, ranging from minutes to hours in length. Large flares can release enough energy to power the entire United States for a million years. Flares happen when the powerful magnetic fields in and around the sun reconnect. They're usually associated with active regions, often seen as sunspots, where the magnetic fields are strongest. Flares are classified according to their strength. The smallest ones are B-class, followed by C, M, and X, the largest. Similar to the Richter scale for earthquakes, each represents a tenfold increase in energy output. So an X is 10 times an M and 100 times a C. Within each letter class, there's a finer scale from one to nine. C-class flares are too weak to noticeably affect Earth. M-class flares can cause brief radio blackouts at the poles and minor radiation storms that might endanger astronauts. It's the X-class flares that are the real juggernauts. Although X is the last letter, there are flares more than 10 times the power of an X-1, so X-class flares can go higher than 9. The most powerful flare on record was in 2003, during the last solar maximum. It was so powerful that it overloaded the sensors measuring it. They cut out an X-17, and the flare was later estimated to be about X-45. A powerful X-class flare like that can create long-lasting radiation storms, which can harm satellites and even give airline passengers flying near the poles small radiation doses. X-flares also have the potential to create global transmission problems and worldwide blackouts. So the question is, if a solar flare or EMP was to hit, what would it do to the hundreds and hundreds of nuclear reactors? We are joined now by Matthew Stein. He is a design engineer, a green builder, a graduate of MIT, holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, and is the author of two best-selling books, When Disaster Strikes, A Comprehensive Guide to Emergency Planning and Crisis, and When Technology Fails, A Manual for Self-Reliance. And he joins us now to talk about the real and present danger of a massive nuclear meltdown a nuclear Armageddon. And Stein writes in a recent paper published on the internet, imagine what havoc it would wreak on our civilization and the planet's ecosystems if we were to suddenly witness not just one or two nuclear meltdowns, but 400 or more. I can venture to say that unless we take significant protective measures, this apocalyptic scenario is not only possible, but probable. Well, it's good to have you with us today, Mr. Stein. We appreciate you joining the program, and we definitely appreciate your books and your latest article, 
It's titled 400 Chernobyl's Solar Flares, EMP, and Nuclear Armageddon. And I was wondering if you could do us a favor and kind of break down the best you can what you put down in this article. Sure, I'll try to give it to you in a nutshell. Well, it, it turns out that uh, the sun burps fairly, several times a year. It's called a coronal mass ejection, and the sun basically launches a big mass of hot plasma, kind of sun stuff, out into space, and it goes really fast, like a thousand times faster than our rockets fly. And most of the time it goes out into space harmlessly and nowhere near the Earth, no problem. And every now and then it goes out towards the Earth. Well, we had a big solar storm about two weeks ago, Incredible northern lights lit up the skies. They had to reroute some flights over the North Pole, but it was no big deal. Well, it turns out that, oh, on the average, every 7,500 years, something like that, you know, it's kind of a crap shot that one of these coronal mass ejections is really huge. You get what's called an extreme geomagnetic disturbance in the planet, a, a GMD, geomagnetic disturbance, extreme. Now, the last one happened in 1921. Now, in 1921, when it happened, lit up the sky incredibly from the North Pole all the way south to uh, Haiti and Hawaii and from the South Pole all the way far north as Samoa for two days and nights. I mean, incredible light show. Burned down some radio stations, burned down some telegraphs, burned down Penn Central Station, you know, set some uh, wires and, and light poles on fire, but not that big of a deal because this was in the days when there was no grid. It was just individual electrified cities. There was no nuclear power plants. There was no internet. And, you know, if power went down for a while, then the world went around just fine. Well, if it happened today, the same storm as 1921, or an even bigger one, 60 years earlier in 1859, called the Carrington event, it would fry these massive power transformers that our, our modern grid is totally dependent on. Now, we started installing these in the late 60s, finished off in the 90s upgrading our grid. Well, it turns out these transformers, they're really great and efficient and work wonderful. Well, they get cooked by a massive solar storm. And so what would it do? Well, you'd go out and you'd see the most incredible light show you've like you've never seen before in your life. And nobody, most people alive today have never seen before in their life. And the grid would go down. There'd be no radio transmissions. There'd be no nothing. Well, the problem is that when the grid goes down, nuclear power stations automatically disconnect themselves from the grid and go to emergency shutdown. Now, when Fukushima blew its top a few months, uh, about a year ago, it did that, according to Japanese authorities, it was not the earthquake directly that caused Fukushima to fail and melt down. The earthquake dropped the grid. When the grid dropped, Fukushima went into emergency shutdown and backup generators and, and uh, battery packs kicked in to keep the massive pumps flowing to keep the cooling systems going. So you got like millions of watts of, of, of energy okay, inside okay. nuclear reactor. Okay, okay, pardon the interruption, but I, I can see where you're going with this. We know that it's gonna blow transformers. Uh, We're talking about the solar flares, and it's bad enough to have years of, of uh, power outages and problems with infrastructure damage, but but you're talking about the reactors. You're getting to the reactors, right. and, and that's the, the real face, uh, the, the real threat that we're facing right now, am I correct? So, so we're talking both massive power failure, starvation, internet down, stock market crash, but on top of that, you're talking nuclear Armageddon. Yeah. Now, it's a good news, bad news story. What, what it means is that officially, these nuclear power plants have to have one week of fuel on hand. And the assumption is the grid in America is always stable and it always comes up within a few days and it's not a problem. Or if it is a problem, they can bring a diesel truck with extra fuel. Well, if you're talking a situation like 100 Katrinas happen at once, the whole country's in chaos, can you imagine how poorly we did with Katrina? Now talk about 100 times over, are we going to make sure that these diesel fuel trucks show up at every nuclear power plant? 104 in America, roughly 440 in the world, and keep these things running for perhaps years while they're getting the grid going, or certainly for months. Problem is they're gonna melt down. Many of them are gonna fail and melt down long before we get the grid repaired. And, and so there's nowhere talking, to run. There's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. And we were uh, you know, literally surrounded by these things. And I read where you said that more than a third, 37% of the population live within right. 50 miles of a nuclear reactor. So. And we also know that they're built on the coastline. Seventy-five percent of the population uh, population lives on the coast. So, right. where our massive population centers are is where our nuclear power plants are somewhere nearby. Yeah. Not you know far enough 
They're supposedly safe, but like Indian Point, north of New York City, filled with plutonium, if that place fries, it'll be you know, multiple, multiple generations before you can inhabit New York City again. And it'll be like that all up and down the East Coast. Now, here's the kicker. For a simple price of a stealth bomber, B-2 bomber, two billion bucks, we could fix the problem. Now, we cannot fix, we cannot prevent all bad things from happening from a major solar storm or from a terrorist EMP. But for two billion bucks, we could implement the fixes on the grid so the grid won't be fried, and we could implement backup parts and backup fuel and backup systems at each nuclear power plant to guarantee at least, you know, I mean, there's nothing foolproof but to try and prevent the massive nuclear Armageddon I'm talking about. So right now, we're looking at a situation that's 100% guaranteed to happen the way the world is wired today. And because these nuclear storms, I mean, these, these solar storms happen, I mean, they're a, a fact of nature, and they happen every average 70, 100 years. So the last one was 90 years ago. The one before that was 60 years. So do the math. You know, it's going to happen, and we're either going to pretend that it's not going to happen like they did you know the the with new orleans the army corps of engineers knew for 70 years that we need to fix those dikes those those levees that it was a disaster waiting to happen it wasn't a question of if but when and they had plans and they even approved the money but the money got spent on other things so we're in that situation now where the engineers and the scientists know this is not an if but when now, and they know how to fix it. Before you joined us, we watched a quick video and we learned about the, um, the different classifications according to strength, you know, the B class being the smallest class of solar flare, X being the largest. How big of an X class are you expecting? How many, how, how often, and how long will the danger last? Uh, you know, well, what are the most credible predictions? What is the solar flare forecast for 2012? Well, the solar flare forecast is that every 11 years, the sun's pole flips. And when it does that, you have what's called a solar maximum, which is a period of extra intensity. Now, it looks like from the preliminary solar storms we've already seen, rough, the, the, the flip of the pole is roughly around the end of 2012, Mayan calendar, all that stuff. I mean, I don't believe particularly in a, in a, in a, in a random number that, that is predicting the end of the world, but they do tend to coincide those two together. So scientists are very concerned that there's a significant chance that this solar maximum will end up being like the 1921 extreme event or the 1859 Carrington event. And nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. But I will tell you, in 2003, we had a fairly extreme X-class solar flare and, it, and it, uh, it converged down in South Africa, and it cooked 14 of those transformers. Now, that flare was less than one-tenth the strength of the event in 1921, which is 50% weaker than the 1859 event. Mm. So if that one happened, and it, and it screwed up the grid for over a year in South Africa, they had to have rolling blackouts throughout the country, because only 14 of these big transformers cooked. They're multi-million dollars. They take a three-year waiting list to get a single one right now. So if we're talking 350 in America alone and 2,000 worldwide if we had an event like the 1921. And that's in a, an official study from Meditech under the auspices of the Oak Ridge National Labs and double-checked by Sandia National Labs. So these are like the, some of the smartest brains in the world working on this problem, and they're saying this is real. Well, um... Then that brings us to, uh, you know, the last chapter of your book, the uh, When Disaster Strikes, The Unthinkable, Surviving a Nuclear Disaster. Could you go, I know you can't go into detail, but could you tell us a little bit about the three separate strategies, depending on the type of nuclear meltdown? I know you talked about a dirty bomb, an actual nuclear bomb attack, or in this case, the solar flares and a nuclear meltdown. Could you go into that chapter for us? Okay. There are three different events, like you mentioned, and the strategies are, are different for each one. So let's start with the worst one, which is the solar flare and the meltdown. Now, a meltdown could happen for any God-known reason. I mean, Three Mile Island, the skies are blue, you know, there was no earthquake. It just happened. It was an anomaly, and it happened. So it could happen near you, and since one-third of us live in America, live within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant, the secret there is to figure out where the wind is, to know ahead of time where the plant is, to have your 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 getaway plan because you've got to get upstream, upwind of that of that power plant. 
And you want to make sure that you've got your air filtered so you're not breathing plutonium into your lungs in case there's air vented. You want to use not just a mask like they showed in the SARS epidemic. In the least, you want to have a painter's mask from, you know, Home Depot, Supply One, whatever. That's got the carbon canisters on it. It's kind of a poor man's gas mask. And there's carbon filters that filter out about more than 95% of all particulate in, and also toxic gases in there. So they'll help you get through smoke. They'll help you get through things. And they'll take most of that stuff out. You also want to make sure you filter all of your water. I use a good carb. A filter must have a, a carbon block in it to suck out organic compounds, and it should have a microporous filter. Most of that nasty stuff will be stuck on particles large enough that a good bacterial filter will take it out. So you want to prevent it from, and you want to wash all of your food. You know, any food that you're getting, anything off the ground, you want to wash it, you want to shake oh. your clothing off, wash it if possible, and you need to get out of the downwind contaminated zone as soon as possible. Well, you're also talking about, you, you need, and every family needs this, you have to have a survival kit. You know, my oh, family yeah. calls it, you know, grab and go bags. So what would you recommend for your basic grab and go survival kit? Okay, now on my website, wentechfails.com, I've got all the details. So I'll give you a few of the top heavy hitters. You definitely want to have food, clothing, shelter, medicine for you and your, your family. A good first aid kit. My grab-and-go kit, I have two, I have a big blue tub that I keep my stuff in, and I keep large and small items. I also have a big box of all my camping gear, because I live in earthquake and wildfire country. And so here, if I had a big earthquake in the summer, bridges would go down, the gas lines would bust, the fire would start out. So I've got to be able to get out, out of the way of the ensuing firestorm. And if I can't get my four-wheel drive across the rivers, I'm going to have to do it on foot. So that's why I have my backpack. So I have a little compact first aid kit that's this big, palm of your hand. I supplement that. One of the most important items in your grab-and-go kit, inch and a half roll of cloth adhesive first aid tape. People say, why? Well, you can bind wounds with it. But more importantly, think about it. What do you see in a disaster? You see people walking down the roads. If it's a big disaster, they're not in their cars. There's no gas, there's bridges are down, things aren't working, they're walking. And if people aren't used to walking, what happens? You blister up. When you blister up, your heels burst, you're not going anywhere. You've got sore spots, you whip those shoes and socks off, take some of that tape off the sticky side, you scrub it on your skin to get rid of the oils and the dirt and the scummy stuff because it won't stick on a, on a normal skin very well. Scrub that off, throw that piece of, of tape away, put some fresh tape on your heels, pop those shoes and socks back on, and you're back in business. I told this story to a real heavy-duty survivalist guy. He's got like 50 guns in his collection. He was interviewing me on a radio show. Actually, more like 75 guns. I mean, real gun nut. <laughs> and he, he laughed, and he said, you know, this is real embarrassing. He said, but I'll tell you this story. But I was in the Grand Canyon backpacking. You know, here I am, Mr. Tough Guy. I'm backpacking. I didn't have mole skin, which is really sticky stuff to stick on blisters. And I didn't have any of that tape you're talking about. And I blew my heels out. And they got raw, and they were bleeding all over the place. They had to call a helicopter. Here I am, Mr. Hard Guy. They call a helicopter. Guy gets out of the helicopter and says, boy, you better have a credit card. And you better have a lot of, a lot of credit left on it, because this is going to cost you. So... Most of us in a disaster cannot call that helicopter. Remember, that inch and a half roll of cloth tape. You don't have that, duct tape will do, but you know, I'd rather have first aid tape on my skin than duct tape. I'm not sure what my reaction to duct tape is gonna be, but anyway. So that's one item. Another item people don't think about, I have a colloidal silver generator, and I know you guys talk about colloidal silver on the air, I've heard your ads. Yep. And so that's like a, pharmacy in a jar you know in other words it runs off batteries or i've got a charger so i can plug it into 12 120 volts if that's running or otherwise it can run off batteries and use a solar charger and that allows me to build an ionic colloidal silver solution that's toxic to all known pathogenic bacteria and non-toxic to human beings now if you've got a strep throat and you can pop a pill and it works then that'll work faster than your colloidal silver but I tell you, if you've got antibiotic-resistant strep, you've got methicillin-resistant staph infection, MRSA, you've got antibiotic-resistant TB, extreme drug-resistant TB, you can put that silver in there and, and breathe it through a nebulizer, and it'll knock that stuff, and the pharmaceuticals won't. So, you know, right now, I read an article in the New York Times, and they're talking about nanoparticle silver everywhere. They're using nano silver in all the wipes and on the floors, all over the hospitals. Now they're worried that some bugs will become resistant to silver. Well, 
if hospitals are using silver as a last resistant for antibiotic resistant superbugs, don't you want it for your family? I mean, come on. You know, if they're using it, why can't I use it? So I bring that with me wherever I travel. Well, you know, it makes and sense, and you know, we all sense. have to be responsible, especially caring for our loved ones, and, and you know, we all have to be responsible and be prepared for any situation. Um, you know what I thought was interesting, I was wondering if you could elaborate on, or tell the audience about the pit in the stomach exercise. Now that's a really, this could be the most important thing you get in this, in this show today. This is an incredibly important thing. Now, think about it. The rational mind is only as good as the information base it has to draw upon. So in order to make a really good rational decision, you have to have information. Now, in a disaster, you rarely have very good information at your fingertips. So you're trying to figure out, do I go this way? Do I go that way? What do I do? So I'm going to use a real-life situation. There was a uh, well-known, well-loved guy from the Bay Area, popular in the media, James Kim and family. They'd gone to Seattle and visiting people on a Thanksgiving holiday, and they were headed back to San Francisco, driving down the Central Valley of Oregon, Highway 5, missed their exit in the middle of the night. They were supposed to be staying at a hotel on Gold Coast, Gold Beach on the coast of uh, Oregon. Well, they looked in their map and they thought, oh, there's a shortcut. Let's take this back road because it'll be four in the morning by the time we get there if we've got to backtrack. So they take the shortcut. It's snowing. It turns out they got off the, off the shortcut, which would have been closed anyways, further up from the snow. They got totally lost. They said, they're scared. They went to sleep, said, we'll figure it out in the morning. Woke up, snowbound in the morning, middle of nowhere, out of cell phone range, didn't know what to do. So here's the pit of the stomach. You don't know what to do. You can't figure it out with your head. You don't have the information. This is, there's an inner compass that Mother Nature built into every single one of us. Each and every human being has it. The beings that didn't have it, it's in your DNA. They got popped in the pot. They died in the battlefield, whatever. The saber-toothed tiger got them. Okay, so you can't figure it out with your head. You know you can't trust the head when it's changing its mind every minute. One minute says do this, two minutes later do that. Then it's like, wait a minute. I can't trust this. It doesn't know. So I've got to get in touch with this inner compass. So that's when you go ask, if you're spiritual, you offer prayer, Jesus, Buddha, Mohammed, I don't care. You know, it's whatever your personal connection is. If you're not spiritual, just say, please help me. You take some deep breaths. This you're going to be feeling, not thought. You're going to be using feelings in the body instead of thinking in the head to bypass the rational mind. So you take some deep breaths until you can feel the center, the Dantian, right here between the bottom of the rib cage, right, right above your belly button. You gotta feel that knot in your stomach relaxed. Keep breathing deeply. <sighs> it might take you a while if you're freaking out. Keep breathing deeply till it relaxes. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna go in pictures. So first, you, this is the guy in the river. He says, well, okay, he's, he's stuck. He's in the middle of nowhere. The thought is the rational mind says, follow the river. That's like the, the rule of survival. Now rules are just general guidelines. They're not always right. So, you know, follow, should I follow the river? So pit of the stomach, you breathe, you make a picture of yourself in your mind hiking down the river. Now all of a sudden, you feel that stomach. If you feel it tightened up into a knot, bad choice. You know it's not a good choice. It's like, whoa, I thought I was supposed to follow the river. That's the rule of survival, right? Well, well okay, well, maybe I should follow the ridge. Maybe if I go up on the ridge, I'll, I'll see like some smoke from a fireplace in the distance in a house. I'll go that way. Or maybe it would be a search helicopter or something like that. And so maybe I should go up on the ridge. So you breathe deeply and you relax until you get that pit of the stomach relaxed again. And, and then you make a picture in your mind of hiking up on the ridge and being on the ridge top. And if you feel an ah feeling, like an expanded, relaxed feeling, kind of a really good feeling, Great thing to do. If you feel a queasy, sickly, yucky feeling or a knot in your stomach, bad choice again. So then think, well, well, wait a minute. I've been in my car two days and I've run out of food and I burned my tires. This is what James Kim did. You know, my, my two infant children are freezing. My wife's cold. We're going to freeze to death if we don't do anything. The mind says the chicken thing to do is to stay in your car. You got to go. You got to do something. Fight or flight. Okay, so, but then you picture in your mind and you picture yourself in your car and if you get that ah feeling, it's like, oh, wow, i got to stay in the car. Well, here's what happened. Heroic guy. He's not clothed for the snow. He's got tennis shoes on. He doesn't have warm wool or anything that will keep him warm in the snow. He goes down. He follows the river like the mind says to do. He gets wet. He gets cold. He's found lying face down a half a mile from a hunting lodge that would have he could have broken into and gotten everything he needed dead of exposure. 
Now, what happened in the family? Well, when he didn't show up where he was supposed to be, the father said, sent out a search party. He called up. He, tra- he got people to trace the cell phone bumps off of towers. They, they figured out the rough part of the country he was in. They sent people out searching. They found the wife and the children in the car. They were cold. They were hypothermic. They were hungry, but they were okay. Unfortunately, not so for the husband. So I can't swear that pit at the stomach would have saved his life, but I personally used it to make choices. And sometimes it told me the exact opposite of what I thought I should do in my mind or what I wanted to do. And when I, you know, we've all had that experience of listening to that inner voice and saying, oh, thank God I listened. And we have that experience of when we ignored it and we got our you-know-what kicked, and we fingers burned, and we said, oh, if only I had listened to that voice that was trying to warn me, I could have saved myself all this grief. So we've all had that lesson, and this, this is an important tool that can help you when the chips are down and when you can't figure out with your head what to do, can help you to shut that mind off, get in touch with that inner compass of spirit that simply knows what to do and can see around the corner and tell you where to go and what you need to do. Well, I can tell you, we, we are certainly happy to be carrying your books now on the Infowars.com website. And, um, you know, right here I have Alex Jones, uh, his personal copy of When Technology Fails. And let me tell you something, he's got about every other page marked uh, and uh, you know you could tell he's highlighted different pages and what have you this book has been well read and now you've come up with a smaller more compact version and and like i was telling you before we went on uh you know my son was telling me he, he looked through this we have our own disaster kit and he's 20 years old learning how to be a survivalist what have you and and he says dad yeah. this book is perfect you know to put in our kit so uh yeah. so that's you know i'm ordering this as well uh, or just walking back there and, and grabbing one but um, sure. so this will be included in our <laughs> kit as well. So um, in closing, before we go, I wanted to go back and touch once again on the uh, the potential nuclear Armageddon, because I'm curious as what, if anything, is being done about this. You know, are the governments of the world, are they preparing for this? Are they just ignoring the problem? What can we do to escalate things to kind of you know, get them to move on this and, and try to do something about you know, total destruction? Well, there's a SHIELD Act in Congress right now, and it's come close to passing, and there was a predecessor to that. I forget the name of that, EMP Act or something. And so the awareness is increasing, but we need to put pressure on Congress to pass it. See, part of the problem is the SHIELD Act is worded that it puts it on the back of the utilities, not the government, to fix it. And basically says, well, after a couple of years, if it costs you a lot of money and you can't get your money back, then come to us and you can petition and we'll help you out. So they got all their high-priced lobbyists lobbying the government to say, nah, vote against the SHIELD Act. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it because they're profit motivated. It's money out of their pocket to pay for preventative measures. There's no, no, no increasing the bottom line unless, of course, you know, Armageddon happens and then they'll say, oh, God, we should have spent that $2 billion. We're actually talking only roughly a billion to, to fix the grid, to pre- the, the critical items of the grid to prevent them from burning up in a, in a solar storm or an EMP. And we're talking about another billion to provide backup fuel in EMP hardened containers with spare parts like um, batteries and generators and critical parts to make sure that these nuclear power plants could get back up and running. So, and you've got a little difference because an EMP you know, an EMP and a solar storm are related, but not the same. EMP electromagnetic pulse is when they launch a nuke up and it blows off, say, 25 to 150 miles above the planet, and, it, and it's a big electromagnetic pulse. Yeah. Well, there's an E1 effect, which is like speed of light that happens in nanoseconds, like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a blink of an eye. And that tends to fry microchips, and it tends to in, induce currents that can damage um, digital electronic control systems that are critical for keeping our power plants functioning, including nuclear, keeping our sewage functioning, keeping all of our industrial processes functioning, our communication systems functioning. And in EMP tests, they found that most, you know, most of your personal electronics in your house will survive okay unless it's turned on at the time. Mm-hmm. And most of your cars will be okay. And pretty much 100% of the cars will be okay, except for the ones that are functioning. And about Mm, 30% of those, you know, 15 to 30% of those might have issues and problems. About one out of seven will tend to stall on the road. But the real problem is that all of the stuff connected with Ethernet cables 
All the computers and digital control systems connected with long runs of cables that keep all of our industrial systems and infrastructure going, those are going to cook. And, and included in those, so that means in an EMP, not a solar storm, but in an EMP, those short-term effects could cause nuclear meltdowns to start happening in 15 minutes after an EMP. And so there, having the stuff on hand to do a quick change out, get those things rolling, get them running, that could be you know, life or death, and people need to be trained and know that right away. Now, solar storm, it doesn't have the short-term effects. The EMP has a short term, it has an E2 effect, that's like 50,000 lightning bolts happening in, the, in a half a second. Solar storm doesn't have that effect either. But then the E3 effect of an EMP is a long, slow burn. That happens from about a half a second to like 15, 20 minutes, a half hour later. Well, in a solar storm, that long, slow burn can go on for two days to five days to a week. Who knows how long it might go? Recorded history. We had a two-day event in 21 and a seven-day event in 1859. So, you know, that's just giving you a sense of it. So they're related but not the same. EMP, much smaller area, small nuke on a Scud missile, you're talking probably a 500-mile circle, certainly enough to fry New York City, Washington, D.C., most of the Northeast, shut down the stock exchange and melt down, you know, 10 or 20 nukes could start melting down. A big nuclear device, like they bought one on the black market from uh, one of the failed states in the Soviet Union, managed to get a larger missile like something that Iran or North Korea had and, and blow it off really high above the planet. Then you're talking a 1,500-mile circle. You're talking uh, Dallas, Texas to Miami and up to uh, Quebec City. So you're talking two-thirds of the population of the United States within that circle, and you're talking most of the nukes in the United States within that circle, you're talking a pretty big, serious effect. Good news with an EMP, the rest of the world is still there to come in and help out and, and help rebuild. Bad news in an EMP is more stuff is cooked and more stuff is fried, so you could have... You know, it's it. You don't know until it happens how many of those backup generators at nukes are going to survive the EMP and kick in, and how many of them will get cooked and won't kick in. Well, I mean, let's hope let's hope something like you know, that never happens. Know. But we definitely got to be prepared for all three of those situations you just uh, just mentioned because we do live in that time and age. Uh, Mr. Stein, I want to thank you uh, for spending time with us today. Like I said, Alex Jones certainly loves your books. Uh, I recommend that everyone uh, buy a copy, you know, and, um, you know, this Disaster Strikes is perfect for a, a disaster kit. And uh, like I said, we certainly enjoy you, uh, uh, enjoy you uh, sitting with us today, and I wish you a good day, sir. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, and I hope I've been able to help people out. And God bless, and go out and do your best. Thank right. you. Thank you much. Well, that about does it for tonight's show. Thank you for tuning in. We will be back, Lord willing, about the same time tomorrow evening. Until then, God bless.